welcome. We're just waiting for, I see that people are still, uh, colleagues are still uh, coming into the room, but um, I just wanted, I think we can start now. My name is Jan Panofsky. I'm the Secretary General of the Guild. And I really want to uh, welcome you for, uh, for our uh, seminar on uh, transnational collaboration and mobility in higher education, looking back and looking forward. And this, uh, this seminar is really, uh, it really marks uh, um, a, an important point of our next insight paper on, on education, uh, on this topic on transnational collaboration and mobility. Um, and it follows on from an earlier insight paper that we've, uh, that we've written and that we've published uh, in 2021. And from that, that earlier process, as this one has been really led by a writing team of uh, four colleagues, uh, Joanne Guri in the leadership, but also Karen Amos, the uh, vice uh, rector of uh, for, for education at the University of Tübingen, uh, Berit Eicher, uh, who is the pro-rector at the University of Aarhus, uh, and also Arne Falk, who's also the uh, vice rector of education at the University of Tartu. And um, both inside papers have been, really been very closely shepherded by them, conceptualized by them in close collaboration, of course, with our working group um, and with also our vice presidents and other fora, but also external fora such as seminars like these. And if I may just share, share my two most single moments that give you a sense of these, what, what this process looked like and how we've come to this point. So if I, if I were to, to describe this in two impressions, one was in, um, on a, in, in a black night of the 27th of December uh, of 2020, when um, the writing team met yet again, and there was Arno Falk um, dialing in from, from the middle of nowhere, somewhere out in the countryside. It was pitch black around her. Uh, it was a, a, the turn of the new year, but the de dedication of the writing team was such that they still held that meeting um, and they still pushed forward. So it was, it was a really close collaboration of, of, of a meeting that, um, of, of colleagues that really met very, very frequently. And when it came then to the kind of culmination of that first insight paper, that we released in uh, uh, early June of 2021, and this would have been about February or March, um, suddenly Ivana um, came, you know, joined my office, Ivana Didak, uh, our senior policy officer, joined our office one, uh, one day and, and said to me, you know what, great news, the writing team has just decided we're going to do another insight paper. And I was like, but we still haven't got the first one. But basically the idea of this insight paper has gone back for a long time and it has come straight out of um, this wider um, reflection that we had at the time on what the, the post-digital education um, should look like in research into in, in uh, research intensive universities, the you know our post-COVID um, pandemic experience, how should that inform how we do things? And clearly we have entered into a new uh, phase, not just, um, uh, but, but mainly also inspired by the European Universities Initiative. And this is why I think this second insight paper that we're going to discuss today is uh, just so uh, timely. And we want to zoom in in particular on some recommendations in greater detail on about the added value of international collaboration that we, that we mentioned then, in particular around the tools and the flexible regulatory frameworks that we need and how we make the sustainable, uh, how we make pedagogical innovation in mobility, in relation to mobility, how we make that sustainable and how we make it uh, recognized. And I think the timing of these questions of the seminars is hugely important. Uh, we currently um, have six pilot projects um, that are identifying what a European degree might look like. Um, and this um, is really, in a sense, from the perspective of alliances, I think it is clearly important to answer what the precise added value of European uh, university degrees is like. Um, after the seminar, so we did this, this discussion forms the final stage indeed in the formulation of, of our inside paper. We will present to you, um, starting with uh, Joe in a minute, we will present to you the key uh, findings of the inside paper, the key ideas and conclusions and recommendations. Uh, and that will be followed by a more in-depth study of one of the implications of these uh, inside papers from the example of the Civis Alliance before we will then uh, go into discussion of the panel. And I would encourage you to join, join in the discussion uh, uh, and uh, as you do so, please use the Q&A function uh, um, here, engage on Twitter um, with, uh, in, with our hashtag future, hashtag future of education, uh, so that we can really ensure that this uh, discussion is as uh, interactive as uh, possible. 
so just to introduce to you the other members of the panel, um, beyond Joe and Karen here, we have, uh, Rafa, uh, we have Rafaela Campanella from the University of Bologna. She's a vice, uh, Campania, she's a vice rector from the University of Bologna for international relations. Um, and she is also the um, uh, representing here the UNO Europa Alliance. We have Andries Verspeten with us, who is the deputy head of, Interna of the International uh, Relations Office at the uh, Un uh, at Ghent University, and is also um, involved in the Night Alliance. Uh, we have Florian Pachenka, who um, is um, a graduate from the University of Vienna, but and has worked since 2005 at the Ministry of Education and has been uh, uh, attaché in Brussels, where he is um, since 2010, where is now the head of the unit for education. And finally, we have Vida Pedersen, who is uh, currently the European Programs Director at the Norwegian Directorate for Higher Education uh, and Skills, um, and uh, who is also the National Agency Director for Norway for the Erasmus Plus program. So I would like to welcome the panel. I would welcome uh, the audience for this uh, seminar. And uh, really to uh, kick us off, I would really now invite uh, Joanne Guri to really uh, present the, 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 this forthcoming insight paper, um, really by way of really inviting all of you to engage in this discussion about some of the key findings based on quite extensive, not only discussions within the Guild, but also research amongst uh, the Guild uh, members. Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan. Uh, and uh, I would also like to start by thanking the writing team for my end too. Uh, the paper is um, the, the product of uh, two years work and ongoing good collaboration, productive collaboration uh, between us, as well as the Guild Education Leaders Group. And of course, uh, we hope it provides a space for dialogue and debate <clears throat> and feed into uh, ongoing consultations as Jan, as you said. So um, moving on quickly to the next slide, uh, we respond to the current emphasis uh, on education innovation, increasing smooth program level collaboration and connectedness internationally and ambitious mobility targets that uh, we're going to see following from uh, the insight paper that Jan just introduced uh, and uh, where we uh, identified six uh, key areas, uh, which we have coming up on the screen, uh, where we actually see uh, the, the need uh, to articulate the value added of international collaboration, uh, invest in sustainable uh, uh, pedagogic innovation, and to identify the best way to build or enhance systems that provide agility and are based on trust to achieve the vision uh, of the European University of the Future. So uh, back to the uh, overview of what this paper is doing, we're looking into the triptych of transnational collaboration, innovation, and policy implications, uh, drawing on evidence from research uh, and examples of program activities, as we colleagues will see uh, in, in the inside paper itself uh, in the very near future. Uh, we, um, uh, we we draw on three data sets uh, and, and, and we really work to provide evidence-based uh, recommendations, which uh, we are going to uh, discuss today. Um, and uh, the, the paper will summarize uh, five key recommendations, which I share at the end of my short contribution uh, and feeds into the consultations that have already been introduced. So why this now? Uh, so in order to move forward, we need the legacy of the past. We need to understand the current landscape. Uh, the experience, of course, of Erasmus Plus in the Bologna process provides us with a very strong foundation to build a vision and a strategy. Uh, and we have tools, we have the aspiration, the language and the frame for European education. Uh, we have already tools on the table that the sector has been using to achieve student staff mobility, collaboration in quality assurance, and of course, invaluable learnings from the challenges we met on the way. So the question that we are uh, probing further is how we can move further and faster in order to be able to uh, achieve the ideals of openness, flexibility, personal choice and scalability of the opportunity, and of course, equality and inclusion in higher education. Uh, the current mobility targets, particularly in the context of European alliances, are indicative of the vision, uh, and of course, also promising programming coming uh, come from the work of those alliances. So what, what we did and in this paper is to map uh, some of the core issues we believe we need and we can address uh, in terms of really enhancing systems and tools for the future. Uh, so um, moving on, uh, the um, 
what you actually see on this slide draws on the literature and experience of our network. Uh, it's a summary of strengths and challenges associated with joint study programs, uh, double joint degrees as products uh, of the process uh, of joint study programs have a long history in our sector, have been studied, uh, and we all know uh, strengths and limitations from experience uh, or in our institutions, of course. So there is really nothing new on this slide, nothing that we don't know and we haven't experienced. What is new and different and needs to be new and different to really achieve the potential uh, that we have and the momentum we have right now is the opportunity to raise above and really address the challenge of building on what we do well and what we need to do differently to meet the needs of our students and the potential we have to change. Uh, we could spend a lot of time seeing issues on the slide as dichotomies uh, or as issues that would see would be binaries negating each other and so on. This is not the way we're approaching it. It's not an either or. These are all positive learnings. This is the springboard of where we need to go. The position we're taking uh, is that there is no one single solution. There is no one single design that provides the answer to all problems, opens all doors, meets uh, all needs of our students. We need diversity and we need to find ways to support diversity, to continue supporting diversity, to meet the needs of our students, as well as our regional and national contexts. Uh, we know that the demographic profile of our students is changing. The model of a student who spends three to five years uh, in full-time education uh, is uh, not no longer the, the norm. Uh, so we need to think and imagine differently for the education of the future. Similarly here, we actually see parameters again from the analysis of our data that influence and play a central role uh, in the experience of staff, students and our institution uh, in being able to provide program level connectedness. Uh, and uh, collaboration in teaching and learning, of course, has potential for looking into the local relevance uh, of global problems, provide quality of experience. At the same time, we of course know uh, that collaboration at new program level, we have all experienced that in joint degrees, requires of course alignment of multiple stakeholders, academics, administration, professional services, colleagues, uh, non-academic partners and so on, which comes with known and recorded challenges, long incubation time and need of resource to overcome uh, systems and policies. But at the same time, provides invaluable experience uh, for everybody who can participate participate, um, invaluable experience in mapping the boundaries and identifying new ways and really uh, the way and opens a way for uh, national regulators, international policy bodies and the sector to come together and think uh, how can we actually really uh, rethink uh, and achieve and enhance the factors that would provide us opportunity to scale up uh, all the good things that are being achieved at program level connectedness. So uh, moving on, uh, to the next slide, our vision here and what we're actually, I'm, I'm trying to be very fast. <laughs> uh, our vision is uh, for uh, a European universities where students and staff benefit from a portfolio of internationalization experiences, uh, which um, include beyond uh, the face-to-face -face type of designs, uh, a number of different types of mo modalities and opportunities. And this is includes all face-to-face, -face, virtual, multiple mobility options, organically integrated into the pedagogic offering that we have, uh, and which goes beyond linear schemes uh, where provision is organized on boundaries of the past, which were here or there, online, offline, um, sort of short or long, and so on. Uh, so we actually really need diversity of designs, and we need to think how on the basis in the current moment where we do have uh, a, a number of good and promising designs coming to the fore, uh, this can actually be both sustained, can be translated uh, nationally, uh, and can be also supported internationally. So we need a clear policy design that supports institution and national bodies to enable the academy to move towards a uh, different systems of design and offer teaching and learning alongside the necessary resource, of course, to embed and implement innovation. Uh, this in its turn is the necessary condition for an environment which can mobilize uh, institutions to really be more creative, to really be risk averse. We all talk about the fact that we're in a risk averse sector uh, and uh, that there are a number of reasons that we 
don't have uh, necessarily time to talk, but in a sense, we actually really need to think what are those conditions that would enable us uh, to really build uh, on what works uh, and think how we can actually scale up. And this, the scaling up is really very important. I'll come to that in a minute. So mobility in particular, uh, what we argue is needs to go beyond physical presence or absence and enable students and staff to have choice. Uh, and th that indicates a shift from mobility as a singular individual experience uh, and the state of being to a process uh, by which opportunity for international learning, short and long term, is embedded in curricular and co-curricular offering of institutions and which enables regional, national and international connectivity. This approach, of course, uh, is the very heart of what program level connectedness can and should achieve. And in order for this to happen, we need uh, tangible uh, uh, support of diversity of designs. So this is very important, of course, for increasing and providing opportunity to all. We know uh, and we have very strong evidence from uh, Erasmus Plus um, uh, studies over the years uh, that actually we know that uh, students really benefit from participation, but we also know that there are clusters of students in our student population who participate much less than others and therefore can benefit much less from international education experience. The current uh, targets from 20% to 50% mobility within the alliances, uh, of course, is something that it would be very useful to kind of think how we can translate it, how we can implement a process by which there would be the necessary conditions to achieve it. What you have on this slide is a summary table again from, from our data and, and, uh, um, and, and also from the literature. So we've done a lot of work to actually bring together uh, all the sort of knowledge we have uh, to have an, an overview of distribution of opportunity. And, and we fully support, of course, the Commission's emphasis in diversifying and increasing flexibility of designs for empowering a diverse student public to engage. European students uh, are often uh, not participating, particularly we actually know the challenges and the, the sort of what and how certain students need to be supported through a number of different systems uh, to benefit from tools we have uh, from Erasmus Mundus and, and so on. Uh, but also we know and we see around us the impact of high living costs in Europe, uh, financial support systems, uh, which impact self-funded students. And that of course uh, plays a, a very important role in which student groups can participate uh, and also how that can feed into program design and, and what it actually means for institutions uh, to be able to support the diversity because in all our institutions we have all the example types. Uh, the question is how that can actually really work with the current models we have for resourcing and supporting and steering this work. So moving on uh, to the next slide, uh, there is a lot that in a sense there is a vision and, and there is a push and there is an aspiration and there is a lot of commitment and buy-in uh, from the sector to really achieve this level of change. And we've started uh, thinking through how we can actually make an intervention, how we can actually do that and, and make an intervention for debate and dialogue in our first, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, inside paper that we actually published two years ago. Uh, and what we actually are uh, really connecting now and seeing with the sort of the, the, the need to require alignment of an education model and the tools and recognizing effort and resource in the context of today's conversation is of course a need for uh, financial activity and sustainability of offering, which of course directly impacts the, the, the shape and size um, of the offering of international education collaboration and the type of designs and mobilities that are available to students. Uh, so in my last about five minutes, I believe, um, keeping an eye on time, uh, I'm moving on to our five recommendations, uh, and I will try and cover them very briefly so then we can have a discussion. Uh, our first recommendation is that there is no one uh, design or modality that can in and by itself provide the answer to all the complex issues that we're raising here. Internationalization in the form of joint programs is, of course, simultaneously difficult in terms of administration, logistics, national regulation, as well as truly beneficial for students and institutions, as well as the sector in enhancing conditions that enable all types of cooperation. Uh, joint study programs are part of a development process, however, and this is the focus, so focus on the process and the conditions that need to be in place for different products to come to the fore that should feed into an ecosystem of activities facilitating integrated program level cooperation. 
current initiatives such as European degree labels um, is oriented towards uh, particular products that we've actually know and we need and we need to think how we can scale up and broaden. Um, and this is in line with regulatory priorities and the aspiration and the necessary aspiration to facilitate structural collaboration. Other types of collaboration, however, are equally important and should be actively and continue to be actively and tangibly recognized to be attractive to the variety of universities that make our sector. This opens a space for connecting with also different tools and other tools, alternative forms of credit recognition and the diversity of designs and innovation, uh, which would connect with the structural uh, sort of the structures for growth that come from the work that uh, is already uh, providing us good results. So. Uh, both the Commission and the sector should continue to promote diversity of approaches to collaboration, including models that are not necessarily and would not necessarily lead linearly to a degree in the legal sense, but, sense, but will get us there through an ecosystem uh, of opportunity, uh, which then means that experimentation and creativity can uh, really con continue uh, to, to, to grow and provide us important learnings for the future. Uh, the, therefore, the kind of uh, looking towards the European degree, we have an opportunity to focus on what we can do uh, that we cannot already do with the tools we have on the table uh, and recognition of a greater diversity of collaboration, uh, national and local structures for moving promising pilot to the mainstream, visibility of pedagogic products or further enhancing visibility of pedagogic products beyond the academy uh, should and could, of course, be in our priorities. Uh, alliances uh, can become the conduit for doing things differently, particularly in connecting the higher education pedagogic offering to the complexity of the world around us, addressing challenges of interdisciplinarity, um, and, and, and sort of really provide more in the tools that we already have in the toolkit. International education based on strong relationship and trust are the only way for partnerships to become more than the sum of their parts. And really, this is what I believe we're talking about today, how we, in order to dare to imagine a truly global, connected, locally relevant education, we need to be more than the sum of our parts. So moving to the second point, the second recommendation, uh, current work in the alliances address the challenge to make uh, all this good work and learning, available, learning activities available to all institutions and provide connectivity on scale to reach the target of half of our student populations. Universities are fully supporting the vision, but at the same time, we need to think whether the tools we have to incentivize application are what is actually necessary to be able to get us there. Blended intensive programs, Erasmus Plus, of course, contribute towards addressing those challenges, uh, but we also need to think how we can do more at national level as well as international for long-term uh, sustainability and, and, and quality assurance. Um, the, this is something that is very important where we connect indicators to actually really uh, take into consideration the current experience in the sector, the ambition of 50% mobility target uh, is not where the current existing reality is or has been achieved uh, on the sort of overall, on the kind of in most institutions experience. So in order to have translatable and implementable pathways for the sector, uh, a trajectory towards inclusive forms of mobility, international learning, uh, creating those synergies uh, is of course necessary and the only way to learn from each other and to think how we can support and grow all this good work, which gets us to the third recommendation, which also connects uh, with resource and recognition, um, the uh, actual academic goodwill and the academic attitude to internationalization is paramount for the success of any higher education activity. We know that we've seen uh, through the Bologna process the importance of aligning uh, what is the so-called uh, bottom-up and top-down. Uh, so on the on this, we need to continue doing work so that our policy tools and new frameworks build on existing good practice uh, and 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 also uh, bring real value added for institutions as well as for academics. Cutting red tape around existing um, quality assurance frameworks and working closely with member state, states is obviously very important in terms of both landscaping where we have remaining barriers. Uh, and how we can enhance all types of collaboration. 
and at the same time recognizing different types of mobility uh, will also bring more innovation in curriculum development uh, and also enable the sector really to think how we could uh, diversify program designs uh, and how we can actually really map uh, all the different needs across our disciplines and across uh, our, our sort of uh, the, the, the very diverse uh, student population that we have in our institutions. So uh, moving on to the uh, to, to, to uh, going a little bit more into that, uh, the um, universities need to be supported to continue investing uh, and also uh, really rethinking how we can actually balance the short and the long term growth, because what we really need is to move uh, and to think how we can actually move where we have promise, move this from pilot to mainstream without uh, falling back uh, to the barriers, these resilient barriers that have been with us for a long time. So the current policy framework provides ambition and language and tools towards innovation and change. It is clear that we need more diverse, multi-level, multifactorial support, uh, and that involves immediate mechanisms for increasing funding uh, for universities uh, to actually really work uh, with national and international uh, bodies for uh, taking a role in digital infrastructure and data analytics, but also uh, to think more uh, and, and really enhance the very good work that is currently happening happening on rethinking about academic careers uh, and bring together recognition of research with recognition of teaching and learning. Uh, and then uh, the sort of moving to that, uh, we actually really need to think what is and how the sector can have the means to carry out internationalization uh, and all the stakeholders from the Commission, the national regulators to collaborate in the development of regulatory frameworks and tools for individual institutions, as well as for the alliance uh, to be able to um, orient towards diversity of design uh, and, and of course the necessary funding needs to be reflected in the priorities of the national funding of member states. So uh, to conclude with our final recommendation, of course, uh, we also, that's very important to recognize and that universities uh, are not a homogenous category. They play a unique role in very diverse regional, national and international ecosystems. And accordingly, designs for global education need exactly to cover and be sensitive to the diversity in the sector and the needs of our students and societies. So universities need to embrace the changing landscape as they do, uh, and also to be supported in continuing leading the ways out and providing pathways for global education, which of course moves uh, and addresses the challenge of how to actually bring separate sets of activities and programs, which all have brought so much, but at the same time, all have taught us so much about the challenge of connecting, of really embedding uh, and bringing global connectedness in the university's core business, which is teaching, research and innovation. So universities should work and should be supported to work more with national regulators, the European Commission in identifying ways to steer and incentivize transnational collaboration, particularly in priority areas, so that all this value that came also from grassroots initiatives uh, and institutional and international priorities to come together and be aligned so that they can be supported to grow. So in, in, in closing, uh, we actually see that uh, the participation of the sector uh, and all the sort of the good work and the conversation indicates uh, the, the, the current dynamic of the moment, the buy-in. We need and we have an opportunity to build on the momentum. Uh, we, need, we have an opportunity to articulate and really translate nationally and locally the value of transnational collaboration. Uh, and uh, the sort of what you see here is from our first paper, where we really put emphasis on thinking and articulating what type of collaboration adds value in which circumstance and the tools to really continue supporting the diversity that, that, that we actually need. And for that, member states, the European Commission, senior university leadership need to do change themselves and enable the sector to continue leading the way. Uh, we hope this paper contributes uh, to current work and the joint effort for building a sustainable approach to transcending borders and boundaries in collaboration and mobility and uh, the, to contribute towards the use of our collective power to truly reimagine and implement future-proof pedagogic innovation and a model for uh, the future of research-led uh, innovation uh, in our offering. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Joe. And maybe just to, to pick up uh, the last point that you made about the importance of um, <clears throat> this dialogue, this very close dialogue with, between universities and policymakers. This is, of course, really the substance of, of what we're doing today. And that's why I'm 
why it's uh, what I, I really, I'm particularly pleased, of course, that Vanessa Devier saint anne from the New European Commission is also here, who has been in this dialogue with us really from the very uh, from the very beginning of the European University's initiative, but of course also from much uh, much earlier than that. Um, and so I'm particularly mortified, Vanessa, that I forgot to introduce you at the beginning. So I do apologise that. <laughs> um, but 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 we, maybe before we. Um, here yeah, from other members of the panel, I would like to invite Karin, uh, because Karin, because Joe, you've, you've presented at a very high level the key points that you've uh, that, that, that we've been working on that we would like to discuss. But I think it'd be really good now to hear from Karin, maybe so, about maybe to, to flesh out in a bit more in depth um, some of the issues you've been talking about around around the the, the diversity of, of approach that we need to bring to this, and maybe questions around scalability and thinking maybe in new ways about what mobility means and how it can be approached from the civil alliance. Uh, that the University of Tübingen is involved in. Karen. Yeah, thank you very much, Jan. Thank you very much, Joe, for this brilliant uh, introduction and this brilliant summary of an extremely complex uh, paper that really fleshes out the entire landscape and that charts uh, the territory in its entirety and, and, and reflects upon it. So as always, you did a wonderful job and uh, I'm very grateful also to Jen for having uh, put the group together initially and we have a lot of fun uh, working together and we are very, very glad for the leadership of Joe, who is our main author and our main designer and make sure that we deliver <laughs> what we need um, for her to draw things uh, together. So it's really a, uh, a wonderful um, opportunity of collaboration. And we are now very, very happy to share these ideas with a wider uh, audience and are very much looking forward to your input. So we are not a closed shop. And uh, um, I will, um, in a, a short while, uh, focus on one of the smaller units um, that we can also discuss when we talk about mobility. And I will do so in the context of the uh, European University Alliance that Tübingen is a member of, which is called CIVIS. But before doing so, I need maybe to voice a number of uh, caveats uh, by uh, stressing that what I will be talking about is but one example. And it does definitely not imply that this is the only one or even a privileged mode, as Joe has very, you know, very rightly underlined strongly, is we need a multiplicity of approaches, we need a wide portfolio uh, in order to address uh, the range of tasks and needs and um, intentions that we have uh, with our European um, education offers. And the other caveat I'd like to voice is the example that I will be discussing is a little bit out of the ordinary um, because the responsible unit here is not the faculty, which usually is responsible for running programs, but it is a subunit of uh, the central administration concerned with teaching and learning. But nevertheless, these offerings are subject to the same academic standards that are applied across the university and the offerings are also delivered by our academics. Um, and lastly, highlighting these offers by no means, let me stress that again strongly, uh, implies to value other activities less or to deny that developing full-fledged degree programs uh, should be devalued. Um, let me briefly begin by setting the context the University of Tübingen is pretty much in the middle of Europe and is part of a rich ecosystem of research institutions, especially in the natural sciences. Because of its physical environment, there is a difference between faculties, as we say, down in the valley or up on the hill. And the chart that you see here includes both um, parts of the campus, but uh, the um, the the bulk of the research collaboration is up on the hill, because as you see, uh, a lot is related to medicine and the natural sciences. Uh, more than a decade ago, we had a huge internal reform and merged some faculties into larger entities, so that now we have six faculties and one center operating like a faculty, the Center for Islamic Theology. As I already said, the main units of running programs and granting degrees are, of course, the faculties. 
And you might be surprised to see uh, the sheer number of the programs that Tübingen is running. Uh, but don't be misled. Uh, the number 345 uh, does uh, includes a combination programs. That means uh, sometimes we have to accredit uh, uh, parts of study programs, uh, those parts that do have their own legal documents, so to speak. Uh, so we count a lot into, uh, into this. Um, as you see, we have uh, 52 uh, part, uh, uh, 52 international study tracks, of which uh, 36 are English speaking, and seven of which have an uh, inbuilt uh, obligatory mobility. Uh, we have uh, at this point nine, we'll soon have more than that uh, double or multiple degree uh, programs. Um, the following slide provides a range, uh, provides examples of the range of offerings. Um, so as you see, we can count this a little bit differently. If we only uh, count the full programs, we have around 200 degree programs in 130 different uh, subjects. Um, our innovative areas are, for example, in machine learning, in medical technology, and molecular medicine, in geoecology, in nanoscience, media informatics, sport management, and Islamic theology. Uh, of the international study tracks, just to mention a few of them, advanced quantum uh, physics, computational linguistics, uh, cultures of the global south, and international economics would be uh, examples. And uh, just to show you the flyer of one of the programs, uh, this is Cultures of the Global South. So this would be an international study program outside uh, of Europe. Tübingen, um, no, let me move to the next slide. As you see uh, from the number of students, we are kind of on the upper level of a uh, medium-sized, Universities, we have around about 28,500 students, um, of uh, which the majority uh, are female. And uh, international students, we try definitely to increase the number of our international students. And in the winter semester um, of last uh, year, we had uh, 1, uh, 4,165 international students. Um, now, moving on to the um, collaborations, we have the international collaborations. This is, I think, pretty typical for all Guild member universities. It's a large portfolio um, um, in all continents uh, of the world, uh, but of course, with a very, very strong emphasis on Europe. And this is what we will now talk about when I introduce uh, CIVIS. Um, CIVIS, um, the CIVIS Alliance includes uh, 11 universities, uh, two of which uh, are non-European uh, Union member states, the University of Glasgow and the University of Lausanne. Uh, together, we are a very large uh, um, alliance as far as student numbers is uh, concerned. Uh, namely, we have round about um, uh, four and a half, no, no let's see, uh, we have round about uh, 500,000 students in the entire alliance. Uh, so that is a large number of students and a large number of staff. Uh, the reason uh, for this is that many universities in the alliance are uh, capital universities, uh, universities in large European capitals with high numbers of students and staff academics and researchers. And so um, this explains also the high number uh, of students. The Alliance tries to work systems wide, which uh, is the reason why it has a very complex uh, structure. Uh, so we do not focus on one particular area, uh, but uh, on a, a whole range. So I think we could move to the next slide. Uh, one of the key um, features of CIVIS is 
that it um, is organized in what we call hubs. And these hubs try to address uh, crucial questions uh, of global concern, uh, such as climate and environment, society, culture, heritage, digital and technological transformation, cities, territories, and mobilities. And as you can see, each hub is led by two service partner universities, but, um, um, and uh, uh, the University of Aix-Marseille is uh, the project leader. It is responsible for running the entire project. Now, talking about student uh, mobility and talking about developing full-fledged programs, I am happy to report at this point, although we are not quite there yet, but it's underway. Uh, I'm happy to report on a master's in the making in hub one, uh, climate, environment, and energy. Uh, this will be a transdisciplinary and international master's program involving a number of service partners. It's very complex. Uh, it will include the natural sciences and the humanities and social sciences. And at this point, it is designed um, to serve around 50 to 60 students. As a civis master, it would inevitably involve student mobility. And now, as Joe has written in the paper, these programs with integrated mobilities are designed for a relatively small number of students. If we would realize mobility for students in the across the entire civis alliance, uh, we and if the aim would be 50%. Um, uh, to reach 50% of student mobility, uh, we are talking about how can we reach a quarter million students. And it is clear from the sheer number that we have to think of other offerings as well. Um, so we need to think of um, how to develop offerings with a lower threshold. Uh, but whatever formats we choose, they need to fit with our priorities and opportunities. Um, so I'm sure that you will recognize uh, from your own alliances a number of features uh, that cut across like the international experience, uh, things like, like a passport or a badge, I think is also a common feature to have summer or winter schools, uh, to have flexible mobility, of course, also to strongly emphasize the student voice in the student council. Uh, but also serve academics in uh, integrating them and making sure that uh, they have the infrastructure they need uh, in order to develop, for example, their common programs. Um, so against this background, um, I will now introduce to you, um, yeah, this is another um, uh, slide that shows you um, the, uh, the setting, the, the various um, features that have been set up by CIVIS uh, in order to make it really uh, work across the entire system. Um, now CIVIS has a number of versatile elements uh, that are relevant uh, for providing opportunities for students and staff. Um, so that collaboration is possible. And now let me zoom in to what we have designated as micro programs. Overall, let me state that the University of Bucharest is our motor here when it comes to pushing innovation and laying the infrastructural groundwork. Uh, very important, and this is just one name I would really like to mention, is my dear colleague uh, Romitze Yuku, who some of you know, who is extremely active um, and uh, very passionate in pushing these developments forward. Uh, so what if we do, for example, is we try to develop a common educational framework. And this starts very basic. This starts with charting the different levels or different scales of offers. So it will start with single learning activities and then it will move on um, to full-fledged uh, programs. The reason why the bubbles are not filled out is that sometimes it's not as simple as it might sound. Sometimes the distinction between single and multi-structured learning activities are not that easy, although one uh, would think it would be. 
Now, let me introduce you the microprograms. The microprograms uh, initiated or were initiated, one of the nuclei, you might say, uh, are, uh, is the Tübingen Transdisciplinary Course Program. And the background of this is that Tübingen very early had decided to allocate 21 credit points for transdisciplinary course offerings and career-oriented services. Uh, the transdisciplinary course program currently has around 150 uh, offerings and has as its central idea to encourage students to assume responsibility in and for society. And these offerings address key areas of concern and are often designed as building blocks that eventually lead to a certificate, uh, such as our Studium uh, Ecologicum, for example, when it comes to environmental questions or civic engagement, uh, which I will talk about in a second. Another hallmark of the program is its uh, service learning orientation. And one prominent area where these two approaches came together is our Global Awareness Education Program. Um, and with this background, with these features in place, it was almost natural for us to use the format and redesign or redesignate it as micro programs open uh, for civis. The key players in this regard, besides the University of Tübingen, are the universities in Bucharest, uh, Madrid and Athens. And given the focus of civis on relations of the university to civil society, and given the various activities in this area in our different universities, we designed the micro program on civic engagement, which the colleagues in the meantime have developed as a blended intensive program, short a bit. Another example is a course that I will uh, talk about uh, shortly. So this is uh, basically a slide that talks about what civis, uh, what the micro program civis, civic engagement is about, uh, what the aims are and what you will get out of the program if you are uh, a student. So it has a number of flexible features such as you can design your own curriculum by choosing from a number of courses, you can move forward at your own pace, and you will interact with academics and students across Europe. So the next slide um, basically highlights what this is about, turn knowledge into action. Civic engagement has a strong component uh, of where um, civil society comes into play and where the university and civil society interact. Um, I think I have to move a little bit uh, uh, quicker forward. Um, I'm sure that you the, the, um, the uh, uh, the webinar is recorded and so you can have a look at the slides at your own pace. Uh, later on, uh, there's a number of just, you know, administrative things, you know, what is it, um, uh, what are the various units uh, doing that are components of the program. Then, of course, in the next slide, you get uh, an idea of how are the credit points allocated uh, to the different units. And finally, uh, you will see the, um, uh, the program. That would be the next slide. Um, just to give you an idea, so that is uh, at, at one glance, you see who is involved, uh, what are the ideas of the course, what is the literature that, it, that it's based on, and then what do you have to do, what are the teaching methods and the study methods, and uh, then, of course, finally, what's kind of um, cut off uh, at, at this slide. Um, is, you know, what is the, uh, the uh, uh, oh yeah, there it is, uh, uh, what is the component where you actually are physically mobile? Uh, in this case, uh, it is a, a physical mobility part uh, in Romania. Um, another example, um, the final one is uh, coming on the next slide, I think. Oh no, I, we left that out, that's fine. Um, now, this sounds uh, all well uh, and, and fine because they have a number of advantages. 
These uh, designs are agile, they are low barrier, they are transdisciplinary, international, um, they uh, are flexible. Um, in the case of the BIPs, you also have a physical component. Uh, of course, they cannot provide the degree of immersion uh, that a longer stay can offer. Of course, you know, the uh, international experience is somewhat limited, um, especially, you know, the face-to-face -face and physical part of it. But even though these units are agile and flexible and everything, we still have a number of pro problems associated with them, a number of obstacles. Uh, so one is how do we efficiently inscribe students and keep track of them. And uh, while they attend the program, they should be part of the academic community where the program is offered. So they, even if it's only virtual, they should have access to other resources as well. If instructors have to register the, the students by hand, then we easily uh, get to a limit and cause a lot of frustration. So we need to have uh, administrative issues uh, in, in place. Now we can do that for the individual course, but uh, then how do we feed that into the larger system? Another issue is embedding. Ideally, the offering is not a one-off activity, but should be an integral part of the student's journey. Now that also needs to be addressed. And finally, and I did not mention that on the slide, how do you integrate these very small units efficiently into the quality assurance system. As you have seen, we have 200 um, study programs that we need to administer, uh, where we need regular um, quality assurance as a systems accredited university. Uh, now the micro programs have to be fed into that as well. At this point, the volume is manageable, but if we expand, then it will become an issue. So I'm sorry for um, overstepping my timeline so much. Thank you very much for your attention and looking forward uh, to your uh, questions and discussion points. Thank you very much, Karen. And uh, Karen, you've you've given us a wonderful homing in on, on some of the key issues that Joe mentioned because they were all really around the questions of nuance and diversity in terms of what we do in terms of in 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 terms of our um, effort to really now focus on the or, or, or really make the the opportunities around international ed education uh, work but work in such a way that they're also around innovative um, pedagogy and the leadership that we as universities must assume um, they all really address this issue of scalability or at least raise the question about how we make things scalable and embed them as you noted it um, there is, of course, then the question that we have to raise to the university sector, but also to national and European policymakers about the added value of how this can be recognized yeah. at a European level. Um, and of course, there are fundamental issues also really about the incentivization that are, that are behind what you were talking about, you know, how, what, the, the sheer effort that it takes to do this and, and, and how we ensure that these things, again, are embedded in, in what universities do. So I really would now like to invite um, our, our other panelists to, to switch on their cameras. And we um, and Rafaela, you are, you are the first to switch on your camera. So you're the first person <laughs> I, I get to ask, which is great. But uh, you are deeply involved, deeply involved uh, from the University of Bologna in your yeah. in, in Una Europa and, and in terms of its, its, its pedagogical drives. We've heard a lot, I think, about uh, Una Europa's uh, joint degree um, recently. But um, yeah, just if I, if I maybe can invite you to have some reflections for five minutes or so about what you've heard um, from Karin or, or, or Joe uh, from your own experience in Una Europa. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Really glad to be here. So my, my view is both from Bologna and more widely from Una Europa. I'd just like to remark a couple of things with respect to the really important, relevant and, and strong point we are uh, experiencing these days, and at the same time raise a couple of challenges. So uh, with respect to what we really think is an added value right now, we, uh, we are pretty much engaged right now also in the call on the European label for joint degrees, we're working a lot on that. And we believe that's really going to make a difference eventually, insofar as it is something which is planned as uh, systematic, something which is going to last in the long run, something with, which is going to have some added value also with respect to the previous experiences uh, within the uh, um, Erasmus program. So at least three things I think are very relevant in this respect. We're not only working at the master level, but we are really kind of planning and already experiencing joint uh, European degrees at the BA level, the 
uh, our bias is our first experiment here. And also we're working on joint PhD programs. So this is gonna be something kind of in, in, in a wider perspective with respect to also the, only the master level. Then there is something I'm really keen on stressing. We tend to focus, and it's perfectly clear and, 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 and useful, we tend to focus on tools, on mobility, on, 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 on ways to do things. But I also think that the contents of our degree programs are something which is very relevant. Making so many different universities work together also means that we need to converge on what our cultural priorities are at the end of the day. Uh, topics such as sustainability, resources, health technologies, artificial intelligence, climate change, and so on and so forth, are identified by a very large number of different universities as the urgent core topics to focus on. So it's not only a matter to converge in terms of methodologies, mobility schemes, educational format, but also with respect to what we think are the most urgent, important disciplinary, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary topics we want to uh, address. And then last but not least, we are really making very huge efforts with respect to the sharing of infrastructures, technologies, uh, softwares, IT tools in order to track careers, track mobility exchanges, um, and also find ways to identify from a um, digital uh, point of view our, our students while they come and go across our, our different institutions in the Alliance. And that's a big effort which requires a lot of technical technical work. With respect to the uh, administrative side of it, we're experiencing a great added value insofar as um, what we are doing is fostering interactions and very, uh, very interesting interactions with our own ministries and accreditation agencies. And the added value right now is that this is happening across alliances. Um, so, for instance, my experience in Italy, different Italian universities involved in different European alliances are actually finding themselves as uh, alliance in order to interact with ministries and, and accreditation agencies more effectively. And not only that, we're trying to work across the alliance in order to be, as universities, more proactive in making our different accreditation agencies talk to each other. So I think we are, much of our uh, reflection these days is also devoted to what the proactive role of European alliance can be in the political context of our European countries. So this is very well, well, kind of uh, nice and, and, and positive. Let me use my three more minutes to um, kind of raise something with, which might be uh, maybe more in the challenging side of it. Um, with respect to the topics, I think that we need not underestimate the importance that what we are doing has also when seen from outside Europe. Uh, each and all our universities have a number of international delegations coming and going, main interactions, uh, Karen was stressing that, with Asia, Africa, North America, South America. And my experience is that um, non-EU partners are paying interesting attention on, on what we are doing. So we're not only discussing transnational collaboration in education formats within Europe, we're also kind of proposing a European approach to uh, education. We're saying that integrated European education is the way to go. We are presenting a few core topics as the important one. Uh, and we're also saying, and this I think was very well stressed in the previous uh, remarks, we're also saying something about the role that universities have to do in the social context. So we were talking about civic engagement, social engagement, and I think this is not to be taken for granted. So the, the, the way to European integrated education is also, I think, a way to promote um, European values through uh, academic, academic work. On the other hand, uh, deciding that some contents are <clears throat> those to be <clears throat> tackled in a priority way also need to be, um, how could I put it, to, to, be, to be treated very cautiously insofar as universities, especially huge universities, have a number of diverse minor subjects and minor uh, 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 sub 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 fields fit in, into into that. So we really need to make sure that there's no competition between the big picture we are shaping and all the diversity that our universities have, and that we should not lose. Um, and and then the other the other challenge I see is that uh, with respect to inclusivity, which I can see at least in, in two different ways. On the one hand, if we want to motivate our academic staff and our administrative staff in pursue this long 
lasting and, and long, long, long run effort, we need to make incentives, which might be financial incentives or different ways of promote and, 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 and motivate them in the long run. We need to make our degree programs inclusive in the sense that European degrees, joint degrees, do not have to be for a very small fraction of our students. Um, and then I think the, the only, not, not, not the only, but a risk that I really think we need to focus on is given how much committed and how much strongly we believe in what we are doing, we need not run the risk of having in the long run first class and second class degree. So first class and second class students. And this is for now. I hope I sticked to my five minutes. Thanks a lot. That's wonderful, Rafael. You brought in so many points that, that deepen the discussion, but also add um, uh, implicit issues that maybe weren't so explicit before. Fall. Um, so, um, in, including, for instance, the, the real need for, for the national level to be part of the discussion, the way in which European universities can drive that discussion, that diversity has to, of course, really be at the national level. And when it then therefore comes to incentivization at an institution level, there is, of course, also really a question about that national embedding in how European universities work and how that's incentivized, incentivized and allowed and enabled by national regulators and frameworks and funding mechanisms in, in, indeed. Um, but but I also really love your point about how this is how in a sense we are really at a European pedagogical moment in a sense um, that is that is also what's worldwide and I think this is um, again something um, that is an ambition but also I think probably also it's beginning to be a statement of fact so 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 I think it's it's really worth reflecting on that um, a bit more but uh, Andres you you are here from uh, also with with you you I mean. You, hugely experienced, of course, on behalf of the University of Ghent, um, but also uh, very involved in the Enlight uh, uh, University Alliance. So maybe um, what, what would your initial five, five minutes reflections be on the issues we've discussed? Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm happy to contribute to the dialogue. Um, of course, I will speak more from a perspective uh, as a practitioner uh, with 15 years of experience in Erasmus Mundus and also in more recent years with the experience in our Enlight uh, Alliance, but I will speak from, from my Ghent University uh, perspective. And I also would like to point out that we are involved, heavily involved, in one of the pilot projects on the Joint European Degree Label, which is the ED Lab project. And I would be very happy to be already in the position to tell more from that perspective. But of course, uh, all the work there is still very much under development. And uh, I will also refrain from, from taking positions from that perspective. But in general, what I feel that is important here to point out is that I'm observing a tension currently in our sector between, on the one hand, a very widespread volunteerism to push things forward, a wish to keep or regain our momentum, following earlier leaps forward. When we think about all the, all the steps that were made in the framework of the Bologna process, there's also a wish, current wish, a strong wish to be more inclusive and provide international intercultural skills to larger numbers of students than we have probably reached out to in the past. In our case of Ghent University, we actually want to provide such skills to all our students. And then of course, we cannot provide them all through physical mobility. We will also need to look into alternative ways. And then finally, there's also a wish to build on both proven models. And I said also uh, novel approaches to, to uh, bringing these skills to our students. Now, on the other hand, there is the reality that the formalization of intense cooperation remains a very, very complex endeavor. Um, attempts at mainstreaming our cooperation in the framework of strategic cooperation, such as the alliances, brings both opportunities, but also challenges. There's also the reality that much, if not all of our cooperation, and I'm of course working for a central administration in university, but in all, of, all of our cooperation has to be rooted in buy-in of our academics. If we do not have them on board, we will not get very far. So that is still a starting point that we should always take into account. And there's finally, sadly, also the fact that the development of joint uh, initiatives takes time, takes capacity, takes creativity, and ultimately also resources to overcome the hurdles that we are still being confronted with at administrative level, at regulatory level. Failure is still sometimes a possibility. Now, what I also noticed in some of the interventions of today already, that there's a bit of a concern that we may be in our sector focusing too much in policy 
on joint programs or maybe joint degrees as a result of these joint programs. But I'm not so much concerned with that. Uh, I believe that there is still a need for such a focus uh, at policy side, because if the regulatory obstacles uh, for this type of, of cooperation, which is very integrated, can be removed, I am also convinced that other types of cooperation will be further facilitated also from a regulatory point of view. Mutual trust is very, very important and mutual trust is very important in setting up joint programs, but also in the other uh, types of cooperation that are being brought forward. Then finally, um, next to policy text, of course, there are policy instruments such as funding programs. And there we have to say that the Erasmus Plus program as it currently is organized, not only focuses on joint programs, far away from that. There is of course support for classic mobility and there is support for novel or not so novel forms of cooperation such as blended intensive programs. So we have a portfolio there that uh, is put at our disposal. Of course, we would like to see it even in more flexible ways and with larger uh, support if possible. So not all corporations, my final point, should aim for the sky and we should not always offer full-blown uh, joint programs, in particular, if we want to reach out to larger numbers of students, outcome should, become, should come before form. But where a joint program is due, then please uh, let it also be facilitated, as these can still be very rewarding uh, endeavors for both the academics and the students. And if they can lead to a joint degree, this cooperation also becomes very visible. So it's still a very uh, nice objective to set uh, out for ourselves as a sector. Thank you, Jan. Andres, uh, this is, I, I, to my mind, um, and please correct me if I misrepresent what you've just said, but what I'm hearing is, is, is a kind of central fo of focus on a central question that, uh, that, is, is, that I've, I, Joe and I have discussed, I think, outside this, this virtual room so many times, which is really the, 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 the tension between the innovative sort of experimental nature of, of, of what we've been encouraged to do in the European universities and in, in the moment that we have in terms of this post-COVID world, and and the, the 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 extent to which, as soon as we start to mainstream it and regularize it, we kind of almost take the there's a temptation or the risk of taking the fun out of things because you're trying to structure things and you need to make things fit. And I think this is a fundamental tension. I think that's in a sense I think also very much behind this paper. Um, so I think it's thank you very much for for bringing that out, uh, Vanessa. Um, can I maybe just come to uh, turn to you to write, really just reflect. Um, at this point, just on, on many of the rich contributions that you've heard that really relate so centrally on some of the issues that concern you. But of course, it's always so fascinating, at least for me, to, to hear about the practice and, and kind of how this is really enriched by the problems of, on, on the ground and, and some of the, the real tensions and, and, and challenges. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, we are very much looking forward uh, to, the, to the full report that comes very timely in the context of the learning mobility framework that the Commission planned to present at the end of this year, but also, as you said, in the context of the midterm review of, uh, of Erasmus Plus, and as well as you know, ongoing work towards a joint European degree and, uh, and the progress and the support of the development of the European University Initiative. So we very much welcome it. So congrats to all the, 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 the colleagues that are working on it. Um, and, and it comes very timely in the context also of achieving a European education area, because here the key fundamental objective of achieving a European education area is to ensure mobility for all across the EU. And how to achieve this mobility for all? Uh, we need to reach out to a more diverse range of learners, as all panelists uh, said. And one way is to develop diversify the mobility formats. And this is what we have tried to do to encourage through the new Erasmus Plus program with new additional mobility formats that are complementary to the, the classical Erasmus mobility with um, virtual mobility, blended mobility, the blended intensive programs. Now, to have, and, and, and I think Jo presented it in her presentation, to have as much as impact as possible of these different formats as the other ones. It needs to be very well designed. It needs to be very well monitored. And we see that 
quite a number of higher education institutions are still struggling with it. It's good, it's an, it's an instrument, it's a possibility, I and mean, the possibility that it is there, but how to design it and how to organize it in a way that has the impact that we are looking for. I think there is still some room for reflection there collectively and uh, that we need to have in the context of the midterm review of Erasmus Plus so that we can certainly, there is a need to share good practices to accompany those higher education institutions that are maybe more struggling than others with that to increase the further take up. And then, of course, the, 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 the ideal way um, to make sure that a large majority of students can benefit from this diversity of media formats is to embed it into the curriculum. And to embed into the curriculum, this requires quite a number of key enablers that we have tried to address in the European strategy for universities that we, that we presented last year. One is definitely to review, redesign the existing programs to embed these different uh, mobility, mobility formats. Uh, it can take the form of of joint study and joint programs at the end, but not necessarily. It can take the form of micro programs, micro ventures. It can take many different formats. But of course, we need to give incentives and we need to valorize all this work from academics. That is why we have announced in the European Strategy for Universities that we are working towards a possibly a cultural condition uh, on uh, academic careers to valorize all the work from the clinics in developing these new innovative pedagogies, these new multi formats, um, to, to valorize, recognize it in their career, in their career development, so that it is valorized as much as other very important activities like research activities. Um, then it requires funding. And clearly, Erasmus Plus funding is not enough. So, national funding is absolutely uh, fundamental. And, and we see more and more countries using uh, and, and complementing Erasmus Plus funding. And, and that is something that uh, uh, we discuss with the, with the member states. Then, we need to ensure automatic recognition of all these different formats of mobilities. We published a report on the February that shows that some progress has been made, but that still a lot of progress uh, remain uh, to be made. So that is why we are going to, to, to work towards a European framework for quality assurance and automatic recognition system, because we see that there is a lack of still, uh, despite almost 25 years of, of bullying process, there is still a lack of trust between the different coalition systems that are hampering this automatic recognition as defined in the in the council recommendation. And then last but not least, um, joint study program is one way uh, as well to, to facilitate this um, this mobility and this deeper transnational cooperation. So it's true that uh, if we want more joint study programs, it's important to valorize the outcome of this joint study program, which is the qualification. And that is why we have put forward uh, this, um, this objective to work towards a joint European degree. It doesn't mean that we want to put the focus only on this. We need to keep the overall picture to look at all these different formats of deeper cooperation. But as uh, Andrew said, if we manage to overcome to address the constraints, obstacles that the universities are facing when developing joint European degree, that will have a positive impact on all the rest. So, um, but there are still um, a lot of progress to be made, we see, and, and some of the panelists that have, have presented the, the challenges when delivering a joint European degree or joint uh, programs, so there are some reforms to be made in some member states if we want to bring more coherence. There are still national laws that hamper recognition of digital education, others that are hampering multilingualism, others that are hampering facilitating quality assurance and accreditation. So we need to bring not alignment but more consistency and more coherence 
between these different systems. So we have, as a key enabler, adopted a very important cancer condition last year on bidding bridges for effective European high education cooperation. Now we are one year after this, uh, this adoption, and we have just launched a survey to all the ministries to assess what they have done. And we know some member states have really initiated new reforms, which is extremely positive, and to others that are planning new, new reforms. So by the summer, we'll have a good overview on where we stand on the progress made and, and progress still to, to be made. Now, uh, quality assurance accreditation is, is, a, is a very important uh, um, factor to facilitate it. Uh, we, need, we need more future proof and agile quality and accreditation systems. And it was interesting in the context of the Erasmus Plus Key Fit project to see that the, the top challenge that, that uh, universities, but also quality assurance agencies are facing is um, quality assurance in the context of transnational cooperation. We are not there yet. So that is also why we are aiming at presenting some recommendations, possibly next year, on that very important aspect. So at Open Level, we are really, really working on these key enablers that have been addressed um, in the presentation that I'm sure will be addressed in the, in the report. Now, of course, um, any, any food and feelings, any suggestions in the reports on the necessary recommendations, necessary reforms are, of course, very much welcome to feed us uh, into, into this work. Thank you. Th thank you, Vanessa. And, and so uh, a lot still to do, but uh, I think you've really outlined some of the, the key priorities in terms of, um, and I think clear, there's clear agreement that we need sort of a, a, a diversity of approach, but we also really kind of really need to work at all, all levels. And that includes very much the joint degree level. And, 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 and what brings all these together, it seems to me, is, is a critical question of trust um, across institutions, but clearly also across national systems. And I think that's also come through in some of the other contributions from, from uh, uh, different perspectives. Thank you. Can I maybe just just turn to uh, Vida um, in terms of uh, your your reflections on, on on what you've heard? I mean, tons of points to pick up on, but but uh, uh, five minutes. Yes, thanks to you. Thanks a lot, and uh, thanks for inviting me here, and thanks for the uh, for addressing this issue of international cooperation uh, and mobility in in a wider context than uh, than is often the case. Uh, I in, in the context of quality in education. Uh, uh, Collaboration is central to achieving uh, increased quality in education. That's uh, that's a very uh, positive starting point, uh, I think. Uh, in research, for instance, we've seen international cooperation has for a long time had a very high status uh, and been seen as more or less uh, a necessary prerequisite for quality. Uh, whereas education uh, very often is seen much more in a national uh, context and, and anchored uh, in this purely national context. So that's that is very very positive. Now, I joined this panel not with an institutional perspective, of course, but uh, that of a, a national agency, Erasmus Plus, uh, but also a government directorate and uh, an ACA member organization, that should be noted. Uh, and in the 20 years that I've worked uh, on uh, international, uh, more than 20 years now, uh, on international cooperation in, in higher education, uh, there is a notable change, I think, uh, in the past uh, few years. Um, engagement with international partnerships uh, were until recently something that in individual academics uh, engaged in with very little institutional support. Uh, and likewise, student mobility was, and I guess to a certain extent, is still seen largely as an administrative uh, undertaking, not really academically essential uh, at, at any level. Uh, even going not more than maybe around five years back in time, uh, we often met with rectors and deans from our universities who were not even aware that Erasmus Plus offered more opportunities than student mobility, and basically had very few thoughts on how to use the program in, in its full scope. And that has changed, I must say. Uh, and I think the game changer in that respect is the European uh, University Initiative. Uh, and this is not a webinar about the initiative, although it's central. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, I'm not sure this webinar would have taken place with its current focus 
without the existence of the European University Alliances. Uh, and by designing an initiative which encompasses and furthers institution-wide cooperation, I think the Commission has created a scheme uh, which enables universities to view their international co collaboration in a more holistic perspective and uh, connected to national priorities and institutional priorities or regional priorities also, where that is relevant. Uh, they offer the opportunity to make mobility partnerships and joint study programs all come together within a new framework. Uh, that can then gain relevance for all aspects of institutions, educational activities and goals, uh, regionally, nationally, internationally, as mentioned. And I think we've seen uh, a few good examples of that today. Uh, and there are, of course, many more uh, out there. Uh, and the role that the, Euro that the European University Initiative is given in the, for instance, in the communication on the European education area uh, and in the European strategy for universities uh, further contribute uh, to its very central position right now. Uh, and by the way, just the very fact that we have a European strategy for universities, which focuses more on education than it does on research, uh, I think is in itself a milestone. However, there's no denying the fact that the European University Initiative is limited, in the sense that even when it's uh, uh, by 2025 will encompass 60 alliances, uh, perhaps up to 15% of uh, Europe's higher education institutions, uh, which is a very limited number, of course. Now, of course, this means that Practi good practice and good results need to be disseminated and to be spread. But it also means, I think, that we should not let this initiative completely overshadow other good initiatives, instruments, and ways of cooperation that take place either on the fringes of the alliances or outside of them. Uh, and let me admit that no matter how happy I am with this initiative, I'm also concerned that there is too much emphasis given to the alliances. Uh, in the European dialogue, but also in maybe in the funding and the, in the program itself. Uh, if European higher education is to truly transform, uh, the alliances cannot be the only answer, as I think there is a tendency uh, to in the European strategy for universities. Uh, we need to recognize that educational excellence and quality can be achieved also through other and smaller initiatives like cooperation partnerships, uh, the Erasmus Mundus program, which celebrates its 20th years next year, next year. Uh, and even the, within the alliances, of course, you need a broader scope on, its, on your activities than just the alliance itself. Uh, an alliance typically consists of around 10 partners. Uh, and it goes without saying that participating universities, international engagements have to go far beyond that. Just an example from Norway, uh, our largest university participates in an alliance with 10 members. Um, and in 2022, which is a st year still marked by the pandemic to a certain extent, it sent out just under 1,000 Erasmus students to around 150 European partners. It received 2,000 students from around 350 European partners. Uh, and it goes without saying, I think, you cannot move all these mobility into that alliance of 10 partners. Uh, and nor is it desirable, particularly not from a student perspective. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that anyone thinks or seriously would, would suggest that you should and limit it that way. But the numbers serve to illustrate that there are certain limits to the extent to which alliances can cater for all the needs of an institution. Uh, and with the mobility goals that we have in Norway, at least, we need to make use of all available opportunities uh, that are there. And I think if you go back to 1987, the start of Erasmus Plus with 3,000 students in six countries participating, uh, European cooperation in higher education has come a very long way since then. Uh, the Bologna process has provided a structural framework for cooperation, uh, and a multitude of initiatives and opportunities uh, have emerged and evolved. That. So today, I think we have an ecosystem for educational cooperation, which is probably unrivaled in, in the world. Uh, the current structure of the Erasmus Plus offers ample opportunities that complement each other, uh, and they should be put to good use in their full scope. Uh, as Joan Guri said in her presentation, we need diversity. Uh, and uh, I can definitely subscribe to that, and I think that we need to ensure that this ecosystem continues to develop uh, in line 
with evolving and, and changing needs in the future as well. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for now. Thank you very much, Vida, and a, and a real um, a plea to um, both, of course, recognize what has been achieved, but also to really think through the, the, the wider dimension beyond the European universities of what we've already achieved in terms of how we can really scale up mobility and, and kind of what is needed. Um, so again, it, 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 raises, uh, it raises the game even, even more. Uh, Florian, um, last, uh, last but not least in this panel, in this first round of the panel, do you have any, any reflections from your uh, perspective on what you've heard on some of the key arguments? Yes, uh, thank you, Jan. Um, <clears throat> I would like to start to, to make a comment about the 50% ability aim. I remember when I started in the ministry in 2005, uh, the actual Commissioner Hahn uh, and uh, former Minister of Science and Research, actually he, for Austria, he gave the aim of 50% mobility up until 2015. Uh, we did not reach it but we started having a discussion about mobility uh, and it started uh, having we started having a bigger discussion about do we talk about physical mobility uh, or also about virtual mobility what is mobility for us uh, and uh, this was a was a good point um, <clears throat> and we are still working on that i mean until now austria hasn't reached yet uh, the 50 percent mobility but uh, i think it helps austrian universities uh, in the current discussion about achieving this 50 percent mobility of course in that time we did not have all the possibilities or maybe we had them but we did not use them uh, or the possibilities that we have uh, nowadays um, I also wanted to comment on, on, on the relationship between higher education and ministries, as it was one of the colleagues who mentioned that, uh, the Italian colleague. And I agree. Um, I mean, we as an Austrian ministry, uh, um, when we started the European University Initiative, we also started a specific working group bringing together university with relevant people from the ministry. Because we as a ministry, we said, well, <clears throat> Here you have a new tool that you can play with, uh, up to you to, um, to build something up to. Um, we don't see any problem for you, but this was not the case. Actually, there, yes, also we had uh, challenges and we still do have challenges. And uh, one important point that I also want to make is uh, we, we talk about uh, high education institutions uh, and most of the time, at least myself, I'm thinking about universities, but it's not the case. I mean, the higher education uh, institutions are much more wide, even in Austria. We, we talk about universities of applied sciences, we talk about university colleges and so on. So um, I think that it is very important when we talk about all on the, the, these challenges and these topics to have in mind also other types of universities. Uh, and in Austria, exact, for example, University of Applied Science have a different financing system, making it more difficult for them to be part of a European University Alliance. Um, I want also to make a, a, another point, and this is about recognition. I just, uh, so um, I uh, slash Austria, we just organized together with the European Commission a uh, peer learning activity uh, this week, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, why? Because Austria had a very specific interest about recognition of transnational education. And this is a topic that is not... Um, that we should discuss further, actually, uh, because um, there are much more problems, and even I learned that there are much more issues uh, to be tackled for recognition agencies. And the uh, Austrian Quality, Quality, uh, Quality Assurance Agency, they reported, for example, that uh, it, it's becoming more and more challenging uh, recognition. Why? But also because the education landscape is more fragmented. I mean, uh, if you look back 30 years ago, uh, you have your classical uh, system of bachelor, master, PhD, but now we are talking about micro-credential, we are talking about non-former, informal and formal recognition uh, and many other possibilities that we have nowadays and that we didn't have um, some years ago. And this is also an in, in increasing challenge for the agencies uh, when it comes to recognition. And actually that brings me also that I would like to respond with one of the questions that I saw in, in, in the chats about the digital credential initiative. Uh, this is for me uh, one in initiative part of this whole issue about digitalization. Uh, and yes, of course, digitalization is coming. Uh, why? Simply because we don't have the people. Uh, if you look on the media, we don't have the labor market people, but I'm also convinced that also at university it will be 
and will become an increasing problem uh, because uh, all these agencies and so on, that will also at a certain point look after new people and new professors, students, etc. So how can we tackle all this? Well, these initiatives and, and this automatic recognition, these are all initiatives in order to reduce uh, to, uh, auto, to make further automatization uh, because we don't have the people. But on the other hand, uh, what I also would like to underline is at the end of the chain, there is always a human being. Uh? So it is important uh, first to, uh, to have a common understanding about digitalization, um, digital credential initiatives and so on and so on. Then, of course, we have to implement it, but we should never forget that at the end of the, at the beginning and at the end of the chain, there's always a, a human being. And um, for me, um, one, maybe one uh, last word that, that I would also say is, of course, uh, it was also mentioned the cooperation uh, Europe with the rest of the world. Yes, of course, uh, this is another very important topic. And here again, we we see that, well, people are looking on us, but we also should look on, on them, what they are doing. Uh, and we need to reinforce the cooperation. And of course, um, <clears throat> like human beings, uh, of course, Africa has other challenges than uh, South America or North America. And this is challenging us also, and also us as a ministry. Last but not least, I also would like to support the comment from, uh, of Vida Pedersen about uh, the European University Alliance. Of, uh, and, and what you said about not uh, overshadowing other initiatives. I fully agree with that. Thank you very much. Great. Um, thank you very much, uh, Florian. And thank you for, uh, for um, a whole range of perspectives. Very, very important to have your um, sense also to, to really think through how, 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 how from a national perspective, you're relating from a ministry's perspective, you're relating both to these conversations and reflections with the European community on one hand, but also with your own universities uh, on the other. Um, but also again, very important, I think, to, to have this uh, final pointer towards the rest of the world and the bilateral uh, way in which we need to look to, to each other and, and um, the diversity that that also brings to our perspectives. Joe, can I just uh, invite a very, I mean, far too many uh, points to comment on, but maybe if you can, we had to pick up one or two things to maybe respond to before we open um, this up? Uh, absolutely. Well, thank you. Uh, really a diversity of points as a sort of the complexity uh, of the issues we're discussing. Uh, I'll just speak on three in the interest of time that I sort of been reflecting on. Um, definitely uh, we are achieving a lot um, and, and we have a number of tools uh, already there and, 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 and I really I think Vanessa gave us such an overview of where we are and how and the distance we've traveled, we should not lose from the focus. And at the same time, what I hear is how the, the work we do, what, what we have a sort of, we converge on the need to look and focus on both the process. So the conditions that need to be in place uh, in order to lead to products, as well as the support that is needed by the products and how those products need to feed back and, and we need to, the learning structure feedback to facilitate the process and probably a need to disentangle uh, when we talk about the real value added of what we do, because we tend to homogenize the issue and to not separate uh, process and, and, and product and how we can actually really capitalize on that. And this gets me to the second point where we also... Um, I think in a, in a sense, in, in some, well, of course, in the interest of brevity in conversation, but when we talk about level, so undergrad, uh, postgraduate taught, postgraduate research, and so on, uh, what we know, of course, is that, again, we kind of jump uh, on the product without thinking of what we need in terms of building pathways in the cycles, the degree cycles, and to really think of the life cycle, the student experience, and how we can actually build all these learning activities. Because as Andre said, we, we want all our students to actually achieve it. And at the same time, we don't want our, all our students to participate into one learn. It's impossible and it's not right anyway. So the question is, and, and, and we know that particularly if we want, and we all want, and that's I'm absolutely certain that we really want to increase participation 
by groups that are historically and, 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 and underrepresented in all the initiatives and activities and scale up opportunity. We know that in order to do this, it's not a matter of uh, putting a particular type of resource on the table, because we know that our students, all our students have more complex lives and particularly for students who come from a uh, particular background. So we need more experience and more often, which gets us onto this very difficult balance of needing to scale the micro with a macro. Uh, and, and, and that uh, in sort of closing on that, that gets me to the point, the very important point that Vita raised, uh, and Florian also picked up that uh, that 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 um, that we, of course, the vision is that all universities to participate in all the forms of European collaboration we're discussing today. But this is also far from the sector's uh, daily experience, and not homogenizing the university as one of our recommendations is also not homogenizing the diversity we have. Uh, so. We already have another question on the table, which is risks to create silos. And of course, alliances themselves need to not become new silos, which is also what Rafaela alluded to earlier on. Um, so we have processes by which partners are selected, uh, but also processes by which uh, the deepening of partnerships and the structural viability of products need to create a condition for a sector-wide paradigm shift if we are to achieve the vision. So uh, then that gets us up to how we can actually interface the, between the, the, the various different initiatives, which makes, of course, a complex issue even more complex issue, but we also have the tools because of course the work that comes from all these pathways can and should feed into mechanisms. I mean, Erasmus Plus is one that is actually really is giving us so much to actually really think of how we can disseminate and, 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 and sort, of, um, sort of benefit sector-wide. I, mean, I believe very, very much, very strongly in sort of taking an ecosystem approach and understanding that all our ecosystems are very complex uh, and how they interact in terms of their local, regional, national and international. And within that, and this is a work we do in Utopia to actually really think how we can create sustainable learning communities that actually cut across. And this is this is very much speaks to the principles that we're trying to achieve. So I'm going to basically stop with those three. But to me, these are kind of where I see we we by kind of having the opportunity to have spaces like today's to really disentangle and 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 sort of think what are priorities and how we could actually engage the multiple different stakeholders in a prioritization is really beneficial uh, as we're moving forward. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Joe. I, I um... I've, I've got some um, questions from the audience now, um, um, so we've, we've been very uh, patient. Um, and one, uh, the first question is really around the question, the the the, the question about the the mobility targets, um, which are very ambitious, um, and uh, they are um, fifty percent for European University alliances, the fifty percent in the case of Norway uh, and, and some countries. So. Um, and uh, and the question around the green agenda. How do we how do we bring that uh, together? And I don't know uh, who would like to answer on that one. Rafaela, Karin, from your experience in the networks, how how have you discussed this issue? If I may, I don't really have great question, uh, answers on, on on this. It's definitely something we are discussing. We are trying to bring together mobility issues with respect to inclusivity issues and. We are discussing, at least inside the both the Alliance and the University of Bologna, whether at least some digital tools, at least some technologies, at least some short mobility and both though blended teaching, blended education can help into that respect. Let me also add another issue. So we sort of we try to tackle it as a sort of triangle. So mobility, which we really believe is part and parcel of the experience, of the international experience. So we don't want to do without actual in-presence mobility because it's all the cultural experience. It's not just learning something in a different university. Uh, inclusivity, so we want more people to be, to be able to do that and to have some international experience, but there's also sustainability. So uh, we know that many universities across Europe are questioning whether to move around is actually something which we should reflect upon in terms of the impact on the environment and the use of resources, both in terms of financial resources and the impact on the environment. So I think that I don't really have a very good answer at, at, at the time, right, right, right now, but let me just stress that it's a kind of triangle that we need to find 
uh, uh, a way to deal with. And if I if I may add something which is not really on, on mobility, but also mm -hmm. on that, um, picking on what Joe was just saying, I also think that we need to make what we are doing much more easily to be recognized from outside institutional and academic system. So I think that private stakeholders need to understand much better what we are doing, local institutions, local entities, and everything having, and private stakeholders having to do with the job market, because that's gonna make so much easier for us to pursue a number also of innovative education programs. And it's gonna be a great added value for our students if they already know that the job market is gonna understand what they are doing and the tools they are Kind of providing to the private sectors one once they get out there great uh i have other questions so veda up to you and joe you'll come a bit in a bit later sorry <laughs> veda veda thanks yeah thanks yeah. uh no, I, I, it is, of course, a, a kind of disconcerting question. I mean, we're we want to boost mobility, and at the same time, we know that traveling is not necessarily uh, what this uh, uh, what this Earth needs more of. Uh, I think at the same time, we we need to, of course, we should we should give opportunities for green travel, which Erasmus does, and we should encourage green travel. And of course, on the continent, that can be achieved uh, over many distances. Perhaps a little bit more challenging if you. Live on the outskirts of, of Europe as we do, but still it, it's possible. So that should certainly be be encouraged. And I think at the same time we need to have more than one thought in in our minds. We we're not going to completely stop traveling in, in this world. And I think that we need uh, international education. We need international understanding. We need a global mindset that is also uh, part of sustainability and, and sustainability goals. Uh, and I think uh, as a previous minister said that uh, a learning mobility period abroad is perhaps the most important trip you're ever going to make as an individual. Uh, and uh, that is the one you should definitely uh, make sure that you do not sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's not just a question of, of uh, it's not just a question of people go, I mean, how often do we go, uh, where do we go, but it's also why are we actually traveling? Why are we on the move? And I think Learning mobility has so many other values that it's something that should still be encouraged. But we need to keep in mind what the carbon footprint is, and we need to work to minimize that as much as possible. But it still has an important value, and we should really sacrifice that uh, Thank value. Thanks. Thank you. That, thank you. And Vanessa, maybe can I turn to you and, and just ask, um, I mean, for general reflection on this question, but also um, on some of the initiatives that you are that you're working on, like the Europass and the European Digital uh, Credentials and how they might might help in this. Yes, well, actually, to facilitate the, the mobility, it's important to digitalize all the, the, the organization for, mm. for this mobility and that is the objective of the European Student Code Initiative. Um, we are still in transition because not all higher education institutions have joined the system. So I understand the frustration of many universities that still have to handle different systems because they will reap the benefit only when all higher education institutions will have joined the system because we cannot you know, organizing mobility is an exchange, so it requires, you know, that all your partners embrace the system. So this is where we are. At the same time, you know, technology evolves very quickly as compared to when we started this initiative. So that means that we need also, you know, to catch up with all the latest technology development. And our objective is to really build, and I like very much because several panelists used this word before, we need to, to build a coherent digital ecosystem for the high education uh, institutions. So that is why our plan in the phase two of this initiative um, is, is to really work together with Europass, work to the uh, European digital credentials and all the, the, the other European tools that are in development to ensure this coherence between all these different systems. So if you want the experience of your student, we'll start with the European Student Club Initiative to facilitate you know, the exchange of the learning agreement, etc. Then it's important that it's connected with Europass because Europass will um, give the possibility to the learner 
to, to share the outcomes of this mobility in terms of ECTS, in terms of skills, etc. Um, linking it with the European digital credentials. So that's why we're working very closely with DGIAC, DGIT, DGConnect, DGIMPL to create this ecosystem um, all together. And, and um, thank you very much. And because in a way it also speaks uh, to some of the administrative um, um, attempts, I think that um, Rafael, you, you mentioned, but I'm sure everybody in, who's, who's been engaged with European University Alliances uh, knows only too well kind of uh, what they mean. But I think that also still raises, I think, uh, an issue that's at the, been at the heart of some of your contributions, which is that um, it, it also speaks of some of the, or it, it kind of exposes, I guess, some of the defects in our own university structures or the way we are administered and so forth. And so again, the question, I guess, is about mainstreaming. To what extent do we sort of try and fit it, fit in the what we create in the European University Alliances? And uh, Karen, there was this one slide that, that I was particularly struck by where you, where you articulated how the credits um, relate in different ways to, to the three different universities because they have different nomenclatures, et cetera. Um, and, and I guess, so the question is, to what extent do we sort of make this work or to what extent can we, can we allow this initiative to really transform us and our universities through the initiatives and through the ideas and the inspiration? So again, it's really about that tension. Can you maybe unpack a little bit, bit more that tension between innovation and mainstreaming, I guess? And how we get that right. Karin, Rafael, Andres, because Andres it also speaks to what I, you said, right? I mean, yeah. the, the volunteerism versus the kind of. I mean, yeah. I'm very, very, very briefly. So, just to, to make some, a very, very clear example, for instance. So, uh, within Europa, we're trying to work on joint degrees on sustainability. But in Italy, we got some regulations such that if you build a degree program, it has to be into boxes, okay? And there is no such box as sustainability. So if we were to join that, we wouldn't be able to fit it. So on the one hand, given that our ministry and is, is so keen on pursuing European alliances and joint degrees, and also the uh, um, accreditation agency is really uh, a part of an institution for us and we're working on that, it's very useful for us to say, look, if we wanna build strongly interdisciplinary pr uh, programs, uh, as you are suggesting we should do, then we need to change the national uh, regulations because otherwise our degree programs are not going to be updated with respect to the lines of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary uh, projects and, and education programs across Europe. So this, is, this for us is a very useful tool to pursue what we would like to pursue, suggesting that the direction is that way, very one. So it's a very clear example on our side. Thank you. Yeah, I think the obstacles, you know, vary uh, depending on which country you're in. So one of the things that we struggle with is just how the teaching load of the professors uh, are calculated or staff members are calculated and how much flexibility you have, you know, to do things outside of uh, what you are allocated uh, for your standard job description. So that sometimes, you know, makes it, um, difficult um, to really become creative and um, in, get really involved and have larger volumes of teaching offered to uh, uh, to European students outside of uh, the outside of the classroom, you know. And this is what the uh, where the alliance I think differs from the exchange programs that are already running because now we're really trying to develop innovative um, education programs and pedagogical programs together and uh, um, with, let, with very little leeway to do this, uh, given the uh, constraints uh, that we work under. I mean, you've mentioned it, uh, Jan, I mean, even these kind of low key uh, and small volume programs need to be developed and somebody needs to run them and make sure that the students uh, um, get their teaching experience and grade the papers uh, and so on. So I think, you know, um, having working in a system that was not set up to work on that large scale um, is, is a challenge. And so we need to make it uh, kind of a, a, a system where we have more flexibility. That's definitely 
correct. And we need, and I'm completely with Rafaela on that point, uh, a lot of it uh, is working with the national level. Um, as, uh, as Joe has stressed in the paper, uh, we are still very much embedded in our national uh, system. So this is definitely something that we need to, uh, to work on. And that's true, uh, the Alliance will help us with that. Having um, that kind of argument in our backs uh, is definitely a, um, a, a very huge lever. And, and Vida, if I can just bring you back into this question, uh, conversation just for two minutes, but but you, you were alluding to your 50% uh, mobility targets and in the sense that, that you are in some ways, um, uh, uh, maybe a bit, I guess, like everybody, like every national system um, still away from that. Um, what do you see as the main obstacles there? Is this about, uh, is it about structure or is it about the students' willingness? Is it about economics? Um, what, 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 what do you see as, as the key concern there? Uh, well, we actually had a, a, a white paper on international student mobility in Parliament in 2020, uh, well, six months into the pandemic. Uh, and uh, what it sort of, well, what it, the most important point there is that it, there, there is a need to create a cultural change in universities, basically. Uh, student mobility should not be seen as something you do uh, as an extra or as something you like to do. Uh, it's something that should actually be an integral part of the study program. So mobility windows need to be there uh, and uh, opt-out solutions saying that, I mean, if you don't want to go on mobility, it's, it's uh, it, the choice, the active choice you have to make is not to be mobile, but not to be mobile. You should opt out of, of, uh, of mobile, of mobility periods, not opt in basically, uh, to very clearly show that this is what we expect, that you should be a mobile student. Uh, and we're we're far from there yet. I know there are some universities that have implemented study programs that do have uh, opt-out solutions, uh, and there uh, are others that uh, other universities are actually well piloting uh, schemes like that. Needless to say, there there's skepticism in the sector as to whether this is the right way to go, and nobody could be forced to be mobile. But I think, at least from our point of view, I mean, it's not necessarily about finances because students can bring their national student financing uh, abroad. It's fully affordable. Uh, and uh, it's more about, uh, I think, the signal sent by higher education institutions. They need to take the responsibility themselves as well to send out students, have the right agreements, uh, make sure that the faculty is, are, are concerned uh, and do not discourage mobility, actually encourage it and, uh, and, and send a clear signal to the students that we think it's a good idea that you're mobile we even expect it from you. Uh, but uh, that takes time to instill that cultural change thank you i just wanted to oh karen very quickly we have just a couple of minutes left i completely agree can you hear me now yes yeah i completely agree and i think it's very important to get the academics on staff you know across the system uh, on board with that because uh, they are the ones you know who work most uh, closest with the students and they are the ones who definitely should give the message that it's something that is highly desirable uh, also concerning the issue of employability you know sometimes it might also be an option to work with somebody like a company uh, for a practical phase uh, of uh, the studies. Um, and there could also be interesting for companies uh, and enterprises to see if they have a partner in, in Europe uh, they would like to, to send interns to, for example, uh, for like shorter phases. Mm. Thank you. I just have um, uh, still three questions, three colleagues to ask a question. So, so um, um, not much time to do it, but still they're important. So, Andres, can I just ask you? So, the University of Ghent has been really very successful and focused on on um, developing Erasmus Mundus programs, and, and in a sense, you've you've been really um, successful at creating joint degrees also in, in this way. And and I, I was just wondering whether when you look towards a European joint degree. From that experience, what is it that you would, how would you see the value add of a European degree? Thank you, Jan. Uh, I, I think, uh, let's call it a symbol, and symbols can be important. And we need to render our common initiatives, our, our, our integrated efforts, and through such an initiative, uh, this can be established. And of course, we, we, we see that it creates new momentum, new momentum for dialogue, 
we are involved in these pilot projects and uh, a lot of work is being done, maybe sometimes work that has been lost in the past and this is being taken up again, because let's face it, not everywhere uh, a very, uh, or, or let's call it uh, completely uh, facilitating framework for the establishment of joint programs has been established. So in some systems, we would really like still to see a, a progress being made. In our case, we were lucky, so to say, to have a very uh, facilitating framework in our Flemish legislative context since the mid 2000s. And uh, we would like to, to, to take this forward because in the end, uh, what we feel that renders best the joint uh, efforts is the fact that you can establish joint degrees. Of course, bearing in mind what we already pointed out earlier uh, today is that not all cooperation should be uh, full-blown joint programs. And there are also very valuable types of cooperations at other levels. But if we want to go this way, then we should render it into uh, the best possible way and show this integrated nature of our cooperation. I also heard today that uh, the comment was made, what we do should be recognizable to our external stakeholders. Well, such a degree would really make this visible. Thank you. Um, Vanessa, um, before I turn to Joe for a final, uh, some final comments, I mean, can I just ask you how, I mean, it seems to me a, a really important thread running through all of the, the contributions has been the, the the diversity and the fact that there's so much going on and so much extraordinary and so much exciting stuff going on and there is so it's and I, I guess as soon as you start thinking about a European degree you are on already addressed beginning to address all these complex challenges that Rafaela and, and Karen etc were, were, were mentioning but at the same time there's so much more that in a sense needs to be done so I guess I guess how how can we find ways to ensure that we recognize and validate um, the, the kinds of things that are coming to the fore um, that are really exciting and they really need to be supported. Absolutely. No, I'm very happy that you asked me the, the question because if not, I would have in any case uh, <laughs> give some feedback on that because I heard a lot the needs for this diversity that uh, it's not that all cooperation should go should be done through the European universities and INCs fully agree with that uh, it's not that all cooperation should be to a joint European degree fully agree with that no? so, so the objective of the future Erasmus Press program should really continue to support this diversity of cooperation models and this diversity of mobility formats so that we can really make sure that a larger number and a larger and a more diverse number of learners can access and succeed in higher education so that's absolutely uh, fundamental and uh, this uh, will continue nevertheless it's also important to make sure that those that have the possibility, the level of ambition to go deeper in the transnational cooperation, such as through European universities that can lead not only, but possibly to joint study program, joint degrees, to give them, if you want, the possibility to develop it. So this is what we are looking at and what we are working on together with the high education sector and together with the member states. And, and, and we see, we see a distinction between the, the, the level of ambition and the reality. And I like very much that you address it in this report. We see this tension and that is why we have launched this Erasmus Plus experimentation call, because whenever we discuss in the council and with the member states, they are not always, despite now more and more dialogue, direct dialogue between the ministries and, and the universities, which is extremely positive, but we see still some sometimes that it's yeah resistance to see the reality <laughs> uh to put it uh, politely so um so that is why these ex we are very happy with these experimentation calls that we have 90 high education institutions across europe experimenting experimenting yeah, together with 17 different ministries and national quality assurance because as as one of you and, and several of you said the added value is really this cooperation very concrete on how this makes work and, and we have heard from some of the alliances that they have already done wonders 
simply by facilitating this dialogue. And this will facilitate the work not only on the, of the European universities, not only those involved in joint European degrees, but as Andrew said, this will help at all levels of transnational cooperation. So that's really, really our objective. So the diversity, fully agree, it will continue. Diversity and inclusion will continue to be a top high priority, definitely. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa and Joe. You, we are out of time, but you do have to have a final word. <laughs> well, Sorry. Thank you. I, I will give it very, 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 very brief. It's absolutely fascinating, and and really, um, I think what what to me is so striking is the the opportunity for cultural change, uh, and and that's sort of something I was actually sort of scribbling on as we were discussing and, and sort of the need uh, to translate nationally the international opportunity. And, and I think that's really so well put by Vanessa now that this is the key that we actually really need to um, to, to sort of shape collaboratively and, and use to open multiple, multiple doors. Um, in order to achieve cultural change, we need change from within. Uh, we need to consolidate this work with existing structures of institutions and move the conversation around international learning opportunities from sort of nice to haves or things that may happen in one offs or in one stage to the core central business of universities. I, unless it becomes central to education and research, we all have processes, we all go through curriculum review, curriculum development. Uh, we all have tools where we think around promotion, we think around uh, how we operate at sort of department, school, faculty, whatever is the structure. This is really where this conversation needs to translate and to be in, because this is where we have mechanisms which are already in place, uh, and those mechanisms need to interface in order for all, all these are cogs of a machine. And the, to me, I think what we're showing is that by no means it's an either or. We can't operate. We operate in an ecosystem and we need to facilitate the process and the products. When we have the conditions for good products, they absolutely need to be supported. They need to also become learnings for facilitating the process. And we also really need to think how we can actually really bring those sort of translation mechanism uh, in every institution. And, and I think that's something that we were talking about the need to have visibility, we we as we as we need to articulate the value added of, of, of transnational collaboration, the same is with employability, with employment agendas and so on, visibility for the sector. We often think, oh, well, there are certain things that are visible, but we know from evidence that this is actually really not as straightforward, but there's an opportunity. This cultural change is also an opportunity for a cultural change around flexible learning, around how we can actually really bring those together. and and. I think we have a moment and we need to make the more also of opportunities that we have when we go into those sort of meta level. So today we are under the guild. We also need to mobilize those absolutely invaluable spaces where we can actually really go into the sort of meta race above the reality of the institution, the alliance and so on. And, and, and really share. And, and I think I want to stop with sort of the need to bring this conversation in sort of in the consolidation, uh, in the culture change, uh, and also in the translation of experimentation to concrete and tangible pathways that would then be part of courses. And that's the only way to create opportunities for the kind of proportion that, 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 that we all want to make sure that would benefit from the work we do. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to all of you uh, in the uh, audience for, for, for listening in and engaging until the very end. Thank you so much to our panelists. And I just want to thank you um, for the, with the notion that we are at a European moment, a European moment that is not about European universities as such, as you've pointed out, but that is really about you know, this moment of thinking about how mobility, how the moment that we are at really informs and, and infuses our universities. And that is a moment that has come about and that is that is going to develop through the collaboration and the conversations and the, the, the commitment that we all have here in this room, the policymakers, the, the institutions, the national agencies and the government. So um, this this has been a very visible and clear expression of this, this collaboration, but clearly we need to continue. Um, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, and we look forward to continuing the dialogue and we will, uh, of course, send all of you here um, in the audience and panelists uh, the inside paper once uh, it will also reflect the, the conversation and the dialogue today. Thank you. Thank you.